You're listening to episode one of Storycast 21. I'm Jane Secker. On December the 26th, 2004, Southeast Asia was devastated by a massive tsunami triggered by an undersea earthquake. Among the millions following news reports around the world was Cristiano Ronaldo, the Portuguese football star known to many as one of the greatest players of all time, but less well known for his role in this remarkable survival story. This is Miracle Boy. Good morning. More than 12,000 people have been killed by tidal waves up to 30 feet high across southern Asia. They were triggered by an earthquake under the Indian Ocean off the Indonesian island of Sumatra, the most powerful quake the world has seen for 40 years. I'm Phil Hooper and I'm a cameraman editor. The province of Aceh appears to have been worst affected. But most lines of communication... Bandar Aceh is a small fishing town at the top of Indonesia and it was the closest place to the epicentre of the earthquake. Eyewitnesses said a wall of water appeared to simply rise out of the sea. There was no warning. When the tsunami hit Bandar Aceh, it hit with the fullest force and completely wiped the town and the communities for 20, 30, 40 miles along this, this stretch of shoreline were just washed away. Only a handful were rescued and brought safely ashore. You'd be about a mile away from the sea and there would be boats. When I say boats, I mean fishing boats, like trawlers, on top of houses. And this is a mile away from the sea. A lot of what I do, if I turn up on your doorstep, it's not good news. This story, despite being in utter devastation, gives us hope that there is always something good on the horizon. I'm Martin Bowles. My role really was sort of health and safety organisation, security issues, because Bandarachi at the time was not particularly safe. I'd never heard of a tsunami before, so I didn't really know what to expect. And then when we got there, it was completely shocking. A huge tidal wave more than 30 feet high, a mountainous wall of water washed away all in its immediate path. It had taken just they were putting the body parts in one pile, but the heads in another pile. I guess it started off as like a row of heads, but it just you know, there were so many. The busy harbour was submerged under a torrent of water. They say 200,000 dead people, and I can easily believe that. I mean, there were literally dead bodies everywhere. And in the end, they realised that there was nobody to come and identify them because they were all dead. So they, they bulldozed them all up. And we were initially, I think, just sort of recording and reporting on what they saw. And then uh, as the sort of days became weeks, they were looking more for stories. We're now about, I don't know, 21 days, I guess, into, into being there. We'd heard that some fishing fleets or fishing boats had survived because they were on the other side of the tsunami, so they saw it coming in from the back end, if you like. So we were pushing our way down towards what would have been the beach. It was Phil Hooper, our cameraman, and Ian Doverston, who was the reporter. We got as far as we could, parked up on, on this little knoll that was still, I think, a couple of hundred yards maybe from the beach. And the area looked just like the Somme, as I had seen on many movies. It was just bodies, the odd standing tree, mud as far as you could see. I mean, it, it was desolate, right? I was just kind of looking around thinking, oh, nothing out there. And then I saw something move. I saw it was a kid kind of waddling around in, in the mud. So I saw in the end I kind of waded over to him. My name is Martunis. 
saya sekarang kok. I was born on the 2nd of May 1997 and I live in Banda Acha. He was absolutely totally covered in mosquito bites and I kind of picked him up and uh, took him over to the group thinking that you know he wandered off you know the lad was wearing a portuguese football shirt he would have been around about the same age as my youngest daughter the day that you were born but very very thin you know almost emaciated uh, we are interesting about your experience in doverston would have kind of been talking through the uh, translator to find out what his name was, where he came from, had he seen his family, what has he been doing. And then at the same time, I would have been recording. When the tsunami hit, I was eight years old. That morning I was playing football with my friends. I ran back home and some neighbors started screaming, saying the sea was rising. I ran outside with my mom and my sisters and my relatives. We managed to get on our small truck, but the waves were too close and it immediately hit us. I was able to pick up my three-year-old sister when she was drowning and handed her to my mother. Then a high wave hit us again, and I was unconscious. When I woke up, there was no one around me. I woke up on top of a mattress. When it drowned, I was hit by a tree trunk, which then pushed me to the sea, in an area about three kilometers from my house. In that place, there were a lot of corpses, and I slept among those bodies. I cried from time to time because I was all alone and remembered my family. He had been basically living on the beachfront. He had seen his family washed away. He'd obviously then been wrapped up in the wave and deposited somewhere. But he was trying to make his way back there to see if there was any survivors. He was sleeping in amongst bodies, finding floating packets of dried noodles, and that's what he would be eating for 20 days. All I could think of was my family. I didn't see anyone alive during these days. I slept on a bed where there were many bodies underneath. I mean, how he managed to sleep in that environment with dead bodies, thinking his family had all been killed, looking around him, not seeing anything, not knowing... He probably didn't know which way to go anyway, you know? I mean, when you're seven and a half years old and you don't stand very tall and you're in mud, you probably look around and think the whole world, everybody's dead. He must have thought that I'm the only survivor here. I remember I tried to kill myself because I thought it was the end of the world. I found a glass bottle and tried to stab my stomach with the shards. I couldn't feel it anymore because I had too many wounds all over my body. Then I saw somebody alive from afar. I threw the bottle shards away and tried to keep myself alive. I ate anything that I could swallow and drank raindrops. Given the, the scale of the devastation, you know, he told, us, he told us the story that he had seen his family washed away. And after that, um, you know, 20 days later, they hadn't come to try and look for him or whatever else. So we just presumed that he was by himself now. And we thought that he was going to be an orphan. We decided, because we, we'd all had children, that we should actually take him to save the children where he could be looked after. And if he had any family somewhere else in Indonesia, he would then be reunited with them. I think I put my hat on him, keep the sun off him, and um, got him back into the truck. And I, uh, we had some ration packs, and I gave him some rations, gave him, gave him some water, 
couldn't communicate with the lad, but we just sort of gave him a bit of comfort, sat in between us, and then whipped him up to um, save the children. Martonis' story is quite simply miraculous. He's clearly in need of medical attention. He's turned up this morning. So we took him there, and there was a lovely nurse from Sierra Leone who basically made sure that he was warm, gave us a little bit of um, understanding about, again, the sores and his malnutrition, how much he was suffering. He was still shaking and obviously very much in shock because he suddenly had, you know, human contact again. You know, all this time I'm filming throughout this so we can kind of get the whole story. Whilst he's been bathed, save the children in the background, are arranging for a car to take him to hospital. Um, we went back to the house to start editing and uh, we got a call from Save the Children. It's a real miracle. Basically saying that they had found his father. And so we had suddenly had this elation because up until that point, we thought that he was going to be an orphan. Save the Children had tracked him down in hours along with his great-grandmother. We then sent one of the other cameramen who was with us, Richie, to go and film the son being reunited with the father, both of whom had seen each other washed away. But nothing could replace this hand. It is his father's, a hand he must have thought would never touch him again. I cried when I finally met my father. I asked him about my mum and my sisters. He didn't reply, but cried, and it made me cry even harder. I was so sad when I realised I had lost my mum and my sisters, but at the same time also grateful that I was found alive and I still had my father. We came across Martunas as we filmed on Banda Aceh Beach. We gave him food. He was eager to eat. The boy is just... The day after the story had gone out, our producer got a phone call from London and it was the Portuguese FA and basically said they had seen him. He was wearing the Portuguese top and so they wanted to help him and his family. I didn't actually realise that I was wearing a Portugal T-shirt. I was a fan of them and Ronaldo, and that was why I insisted my dad to buy that T-shirt for me. It was absolutely tremendous, but again, it didn't stop there for Martunis. It really didn't. His dream is to be a footballer, but it is a dream that may have perished on these beaches. Three I was fortunate Martinez enough to go back to Bandarache six months after. We met up with uh, Martunis and his father in their new house. The Portuguese in particular, not least of them Cristiano Ronaldo, who visited Indonesia, took the young boy's story to their hearts. And the Portuguese FA, they had found out that his favourite player was Ronaldo. In his native tongue, he told an interviewer that when he met Martunis and reflected on what he'd been through, he saw a brave, beautiful and healthy boy. Ronaldo and Martunis spent time together playing video games, his father tells us. Then he gave him one of his... Footballs. And whilst there, we found out that he was actually going to go and open that season's league for the Portuguese FA. Meeting Ronaldo was like a dream. And it gave me motivation and encouragement to stay alive after the loss of my mum and my sisters. When Martunis walked out holding Ronaldo's hand, they gave them a bond. For the most recent athlete of Sporting, Martunis! I don't think it was any coincidence that when it turned out Martunis actually was good at football, that he ended up at Sporting Lisbon's uh, academy in Portugal. I thought, Ibu, I always thought, but 
Nah, I always remember my mom every day and pray for her. Keluarga saya. I want to be successful and I want my my parents proud of me. He was there for a couple of years, but he got injured. And following that, he moved back to Bandarache and got married. And we now wait the next chapter of his life story. I don't think any of us realised the significance of the jersey. It was phenomenal, the impact that had. Since the making of this documentary, Martunas' wife has given birth to a baby girl. The family remain in Aceh, Indonesia. Miracle Boy was written and produced by Robert Mulhern. Recordings in Indonesia by Ferah Israfila. For more information on this story, visit skynews.com forward slash storycast21. Next time... Hello there, uh, my name is Raoul Moat. A chilling phone call leads to one of this century's most notorious manhunts. What's the matter is, I'm not coming in alive. You've hustled me for so many years. Come anywhere near me and I'll kill you.